begin this bulletin with the presidency because the ambassador designate of the Republic of Korea, His Excellency Kim Ji Jun, Friday presented his letters of credence to the President of the Republic, His Excellency Adam Abaro, at a ceremony in State House. The new Korean diplomat reaffirmed his country's commitment to support the Gambia's development priorities, particularly in the areas of agriculture and capacity building. Momo Dijalo reports. Relations between the Gambia and the Republic of Korea continue to flourish with the arrival of His Excellency Ambassador-designate Kim Ji Jun. He was received by a ceremonial guard mounted by elements of the State Guard Battalion. After inspecting the quarter guard, the new ambassador designate was escorted to deliver his letters of credence to President Barrow, with the presence of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Mamadou Tangara, and the Honorable Consul General of Korea, Muhammad Jah. Speaking to reporters after the ceremony, Ambassador Ji Jun spoke of the historical ties that bind the two countries, whilst also reaffirming the Republic of Korea's long-standing commitment to support the Gambia's development efforts. We are working very closely to this time to promote the agricultural area, we have to get some, some way to sort out some kind of problems here. And then we will try to overcome for the food security. security. And we will try to get implantation of some Korean varieties here, which can produce five or six times more than the African rice. And if it works, uh, we will contribute to solve this food security problem here in, in Gambia. That is the first uh, our... The reveal that his government will soon replicate a similar rice project that has already been piloted in Guinea-Bissau to enhance food security in the Gambia, adding that the Republic of Korea has the technology and expertise in this field. The Korean ambassador and delegation were later seen off by the Foreign Affairs Minister, Dr. Mamoru Tangara. Mamoru Jalo, GRTS News. To somber mood in Brikama Sateba, because the Alcalo of West Coast region's capital, Al Haji Dembo Santang Bojang, has died on Thursday, age 89. On Friday, hundreds of mourners from far and near attended his burial at his former residence in Brikama after the Congregational Friday prayers. Ibrahim Jalo reports. Yet al Kalog of Gama, Dembo Santam Bojang, dies age 89. Mourners from different parts of the Gambia and beyond converge in Brikama today for the funeral rites and burial of the late traditional leader. Bojang, a retired police commissioner and former chief of Combo Central, passed away on Thursday evening after a brief illness. His demise shocked the nation, especially those in Brikama and the rest of the West Coast region. Dembo Santam Bojang served in the Gambia Police Force and rose through the ranks to Deputy Inspector General of Police. He was appointed Alcala of Brikama. He was among the Council of Elders of the town, an advisor of the West Coast Region Body of Alcalolo, and also the Chairman of the West Coast Region Council of Elders. Top government officials, including cabinet ministers, district chiefs, security personnel, and other personalities, joined thousands of sympathizers at the funeral services. Mona spoke of his service to the nation that would rest in the history of the Gambia. Ibrahim Ashida, the newly appointed Minister of Works, described the late Alcalo Bojang as patriotic son of the land. Uncle Dembo Santang, as we fondly called him, was a patriot. He lived his entire life for humanity, helping people, supporting people, and uh, also providing all forms of assistance whatever he could to make people happy, he did that. The Minister of Interior, Siaka Sonko, recounted the late Bojang's service in the police force and the country at large, citing honesty. I've worked with him in the police, and I found him to be dedicated, hardworking, and very straightforward. Um, and the next thing he did for us, a legacy, he left his son, who is now deputy IG in charge of police operation. 
doing a very good job. We have uh, lost a very great man. Pam Modu Bojang is a son of the late elderly state man. He described the death of his father as huge loss to Brikama and the country at large. I'm having a mixed feeling. I'm very sad at the moment, but at the same time, I'm very happy. Uh, sad in the fact that I won't be able to see me to see him again, uh, because this is death. When you go, you never return. Happy in the sense that uh, uh, the number of people and the kind of people I've seen in this event, you know, is really laudable. So that shows me that uh, my late father is not only for us, but is for the entire um, Gambia. The late Alcalo Bojang is survived by four wives, children and grandchildren. Ibrahim Ajalo, GRTS News. Meanwhile, the late Alhaji Dembo Santang Bojang was born to Kakai Bara Bali Bojang in 1933, and he attended Amitage High School and St. Augustine's. He briefly worked at the then Cooperative Union before joining the Gambia Police Force as a cadet officer. Bojang served as officer commanding of many divisions across the country. Alhaji Dembo Santang Bojang also served as officer commanding OC of the Criminal Investigation Department and the director of the Gambia Immigration Department. He was commissioner of police and after the amalgamation of the police and the gendarmerie, he became deputy inspector general of police. Following the death of his uncle, Yankuba Bojang, in the U.S., he resigned contested and won the Brikama chieftaincy elections in April 1993. Bojang was also a member of the National Consultative Committee set up to consult the people about the transitional program of the junta, which seized power in 1994. The late Alaji Dembo Santang Bojang continued his chieftaincy up to 2010 when he was removed by former President Yaya Jame for undisclosed reasons. Mr. Bojang also served as advisor to the Gambia Police Force. He was appointed Alcalo by the Council of Elders in Brikama, fondly known as Bulundala, and the government of the Gambia in 2020. Since then, he has been the Alcalo of Brikama until his demise last evening. Alhaji Dembo Santang Bojang was survived by four wives, many children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren. May his soul rest in genital fjordaus. Moving on, Peace Hope the Gambia, in partnership with UNFPA and the National Youth Council, held a day's forum on ways to improve youth leadership and political participation. As Sena Bujani reports, the program was graced by National Assembly members and other stakeholders. Gave young people from different youth organizations the opportunity to better understand the need for more political participation in national development. Fatimata Kamara of Peace Hub the Gambia said no one should be left behind in politics. We all know that the Gambia is blessed with a youthful population, but we are left behind. In terms of decision making processes, we are also left behind. However, Peace Hub the Gambia deemed it necessary to create this platform for young people to share ideas, pave ways in order to increase more effective youth political participation. This platform will, however, avail young people to share lessons learned focusing on the recently concluded assembly elections. This would, however, inspire more youthful uh, political participation and raise awareness of our rights and responsibility that we have towards our country. Representing the National Youth Council, Ismail Abaji emphasized that youth and women should participate fully in politics. Young people came out. Although we didn't, we, we, we didn't have the number that we wanted, but we can thank God because this is just the beginning. We have just started. We have just started. And then I can see no relenting. I can see no going back. I can see no turning back, no shying away. The problem with Gambian young people is self-belief. That is the challenge that we have. It's not that we don't have the capacity. We have the capacity. What we lack is the self-belief, can I do it? Can I do it? Can I do it? Look, you can do it. Yes, you can do it. And nobody will tell you, yes, you can do it. It's for you to believe in yourself, have that, self, that sense of self-drive to drive yourself. I will do it. Let that will be there and it will push you through. And then you will see how you will demonstrate success, how you will demonstrate 
ability, how you will demonstrate capacity that you have in you. It will come out. The forum included a panel discussion centered on the role of young people in community service, as well as their role in the recently concluded National Assembly election. One of the reasons that um, motivated me to um, to contest as a National Assembly member for Sunny Metro constituency, um, one is um, the female participation in the National Assembly. At the National, the Gambia National Assembly um, is very, very minimal. And uh, the second thing is um, youth participation. And uh, I felt um, most young people um, should be decision makers. Um, and, uh, you know, with the parliament, of course, that's where we, we provide our laws. And uh, I think um, young people should also be part of the law makers. And uh, these are things I felt, um, which is also a very, um, which is also minimal at the, at the National Assembly. So I was, you know, contented with the organizations that I, I was leading. But I also wasn't paying attention that, you know, most of these organizations that I was leading, you know, I, some I co-founded, others I, I was able to take them from a certain level, you know, and push them upwards, you know. Some are nationally, some are well-renowned, you know, others are doing big things in the community. And not knowing also, I was able to at least create other leaders as well without even knowing it through, through my leadership, you know, like I could say, my leadership approach. You know. There are different misconceptions. There are different, it, 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 it's very uh, subjective. Some will say that the country is at a cross, crossroad with deep economical, social, and political challenges. Otherwise, others, others will also say that the Gambia is, is a safe haven for a lot of them. This is subjective. You and I, we have our different perspective. We have our different uh, opinion. But at the end of the day, how do we ensure that this country is put, to, uh, is put on the right path? That is why we are at the Youth Leadership Forum today. My entire journey in being the first ever elected female chairperson started with meaningful participation. So I felt that young women were not represented at council, that's the National Youth Council. And sometimes when I sit down, I always think, what are they discussing? Especially when my chairperson tells me I'm going for a board meeting. I'm like, why are they discussing? And there's no woman in that committee. Internally displaced people in Funye recently received food and non-food items from Child Fund the Gambia. GRTS is Yusuf Aboyeng has more. 300 bags of 50 kilogram rice, cooking oil and 300 packets of soap are meant to support 300 internally displaced people and their host families in Pondali, Sangajor, Buyam and Sibanor. Victims were affected as a result of the recent border clashes between the Senegalese military and the MFDC separatists. Muskuta Koma is Child Fund the Gambia country director. The first response strategy was for Child Fund to come up with a master response plan to support the system. Of course, based on the recommendation of the NDMA uh, or the government response report. And uh, as per the master response plan, we noticed that we really need to complement the efforts of the government in providing food and non-food items. In addition to this, Child Fund is finalizing procurement procedures to set up five child-friendly spaces in the five communities that have received the highest number of internally displaced persons and the children. The child-friendly spaces will be providing psychosocial support to children, 
and that they are families. The manager for Nyedindim Federation, Idiba, said the move is in fulfillment of their responsibility to support affected people. This time we are reaching 300 you know, families. The same rice, you know, um, oil and uh, soap. So I want to um, assure the beneficiaries that despite the fact that it is an emergency situation, but normally we have to um, support the children in this kind of, you know, uh, emergencies. The regional disaster coordinator for the West Coast region, Bintasi Jadama, described the donation as useful, saying it is meant to ease the pressure on the host to displaced families as well boost the nutritional status of beneficiary, especially children. The total families registered for the entire period from 13th March to date is 1,800 families. Out of the 1,800 families, government being the duty bearer, government was able to support 500 families, but through government's intervention and coordination, partners are coming on board and the support is going on smoothly. On behalf of the beneficiaries, Maria Majaju of Bondali expressed gratitude to the donors for the support and assured that the donated items will be put into good use. Ms. Faboyan, GRTS News. Still on IDPs because the United Nations World Food Program has launched cash transfers to assist internally displaced people, refugees and host families in Fonyi Kansala within the West Coast region. Conflict in the troubled Senegalese region of Kasamas has led to mass cross-border displacement. Again, Yusuf Abojang filing this report. Households, each household will receive $2,330 per month from April to June 2022. World Food Program representative and country director in the Gambia, Yashio Smoha, said the assistance will help conflict affected families meet their basic food needs and supplement the destroyed or lost food stocks. He explained that families affected by the armed conflict were suffering from a difficult food security situation due to poor harvest. Last year, socio-economic fallout of COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the rising cost of food items. These people had to leave, had to leave their homes, leaving their livestock, farmlands, everything, livelihood, coming here and then staying here. So they're in a very, very vulnerable situation. And also, the country itself, the Gambia, is going through the very difficult period of the world food insecurity during the past decade. And we have, as you know very well, the prices of food, fuel, basic items are increasing. So these vulnerable people are the, are the most affected. So we as a humanitarian agency work with National, National Disaster Management Agency for this is our mandate to support these people. WFP boss noted that urgent support is needed to provide humanitarian relief and protect livelihoods for the most vulnerable families. This assistance, he added, comes at a time when the level of food insecurity and malnutrition is very high in the country. The executive director of the National Disaster Management Agency, Zana Dahaba, said the emergency response delivered collaboration with the National Disaster Management Agency and the Red Cross Society, targeting families identified through a joint assessment conducted by WFP and UN partners in support of the Gambian government. WFP, he said, serves as an effective humanitarian and development partner to the government of the Gambia in the fights against hunger and malnutrition through its programs, including crisis response, among others. World Food Program has always been a highly dependable partner in terms of humanitarian crisis supporting Gambia government's resilient program. Uh, the, pros, the beneficiaries, I can say, are receiving their money and I also want to thank the Q Money for providing this um, electronic service, service to, to the victims. I'm really impressed with the kind of service that I have seen here today. The National Assembly member for Fonyi, Councillor Almami Jiba, said the assistance came at a time when many victims have lost their sources of income while commending WFP for the support rendered to affected people in the five districts of Fonyi. Since the 24th of January 2022 down to the 13th incident, and out of the last incident on the 8th, you could see individual support, you know, CBOs, you know, government institutions and also the Disaster Management Agency, and most of the Red Cross. And also Dindim Bantaba has also been a partner of this disaster. 
uh, I could say it individually, it's, it's amazing. And uh, the call that each of those organizations have did, it has, uh, it has been so reflective to the life and the life of the family. The United Nations World Food Program is the world's largest humanitarian organization saving lives in emergencies and using food assistance to build a pathway to peace, stability, and prosperity for people recovering from conflict, disaster, and the impact of climate change. This is for Bojan, GRTS News. Meanwhile, the United Nations Population Fund donated food items to the National Disaster Management Agency for onward delivery to the internally displaced people and refugees who are now seeking shelter in Fony as a result of conflict in the Senegalese troubled region of Casamans. The ceremony held at the Disaster Management Headquarters in Kaniping was the latest humanitarian assistance for the victims of the conflict since the showdown broke out between the MFDC rebels and Senegalese forces. Let's take a listen. The Gambia um, is supporting the government's call to um, contribute to the response um, as a result of the Casa Mass crisis. You know, as we all know, we, we're having an influx of people coming from Casa Mass as well as internally displaced persons. So as a result of that, um, we have also, um, as part of our humanitarian response, try to um, contribute um, towards the um, food supplement needs of, of the communities in the Fonies. Um, apart from that, um, we had earlier provided support in the form of dignity kits, uh, and, and then we hope to provide more of that kind of support. Next week, we are also em embarking on um, building capacity for, of, of our partners to um, basically respond to, to humanitarian emergencies. I received of this support from UNFPA. As we are aware, UNFPA is a very good partner to NDMA when it comes to um, uh, disaster issues in this country. On behalf of Gambia government, I want to thank UNFPA in no small measure for strengthening the partnership between UNFPA and the government of the Gambia. What we have seen today is a clear testimony that um, UNFPA is a dependable partner when it comes to supporting the resilient building in this country. As we are here, we have 18,559 people who are already affected, 1,736 households. What this support will actually go a long way in trying to build the resilience of the population who have been actually affected. That was the assistant UNFPA country representative, Lamin Kamara, and the executive director of National Disaster Management Agency, Mr. Sanada Habade, on presentation of food items for onward delivery to internally displaced people and refugees seeking sanctuary in Fonyi as a result of conflict in Casamans. Now we will take a short break, but up next is news beyond our border station. Hello, Sister Nya here, and today we are doing the unboxing of the official 4G LTE CPE router. Have you gotten yours yet? Here it is. All right, now let's do the unboxing of the official 4G CPE router. I do love the sound of opening new stuff. And this right here is a beauty. What you don't know is it also takes you for an extra six hours of charge when there's no power. No power, no problem. Get your CPE routers now at your nearest official outlet and thank me later. In the internationals, after not having a health center for almost 20 years, a community in Darfur is finally able to access medical care due to the opening of a new clinic. France 24 has more. A moment of communal joy for a vital service. These residents in northern Sudan celebrated the opening of a new health center. They had been forced to travel long distances to access medical care, and many women would give birth at their local midwife's house. The people feel cared for, they receive adequate services, and medicine is available in the center, and the place is comfortable. 
This village has been without a medical center since 2004, after its dispensary was destroyed in the conflicts between Khartoum and separatists. Residents fled. But since 2018, little by little, some 8,000 people have returned to the area after having spent years living in displacement camps. The World Health Organization held a lengthy consultation period to better understand locals' needs before opening the when clinic. When the community is being informed and taking an informed decision about the kind of, of, of health services that they are asking or they need, so they are not only just recipient of the services, but they are part of the planning and the design and later on even in the protection of these health services. Sudan is among some 115 countries that are part of a partnership with the WHO, which aims to provide universal health coverage. More than 900 million people have benefited from the program. Elsewhere, Russian strikes have hit several regions across Ukraine on Tuesday, including the western hub of Lviv, six railway stations and a mountainous region bordering Hungary, which was targeted for the first time, officials said. More in this France 24 News report. Right has said that it has now switched to an offensive posture rather than merely defending their positions. That doesn't mean to say a counter-offensive across the entire line of contact, which is extremely long. I mean, it goes really from the north of Kharkiv here, uh, sorry, I should say here, uh, all the way down to uh, Mykolaiv and the Black Sea coast. So that is an extremely long uh, line of contact. And we're not talking about Ukrainian counter-offensives everywhere, but there has certainly been a significant one around Kharkiv here. Uh, still heavy p fighting around these areas that I've got in green and uh, black, which is where the heaviest fighting, for example, Izum, where, where a lot of the Russian forces are concentrated, but also here um, in uh, from the south of, of, of the Donbass. So essentially what we're seeing is a continuation of, uh, uh, of Russian tact tactics to try and squeeze this bulge here and eventually envelop Ukrainian forces, but round here, the situation has actually been relatively static in the last few days in terms of the, the big strategy of Russia, which is to envelop Ukrainian forces, but still heavy fighting here, here around these green and black circles. Um, so Russia's approach essentially doesn't seem to have changed, although it, its way of operating has certainly changed since uh, it failed to do this lightning offensive on Kiev a few weeks ago. Uh, different, different modus operandi, but still not able to essentially envelop uh, those Ukrainian forces, which, as I said, have conducted counterattacks around Kharkiv. But also they're saying that they've made a progress, the Ukrainians. This is in parts of Kherson Oblast and around Mykolaiv as well. Um, so we'll have to see, but certainly the fact that uh, the Ukrainian military is saying that they are switching to offensives in some areas that reflect perhaps a certain level of confidence, perhaps re reflecting also this resupply of, of Ukraine by outside powers, though, um, you know, what happens in the long run, it's very, very hard to predict, Will, because, of course, in a war of attrition, uh, there are so many different factors. One just can't really uh, predict how all of this is going to end up. Will it last for weeks, months, years? What would, what sort of level of Western support uh, does Ukraine really count on? Uh, what will uh, the Kremlin decide around May the 9th, which is, of course, a very symbolic and important day in Russia, uh, victory over Nazi Germany? being celebrated? Uh, will there be some kind of tactical uh, success being touted as a reason to, to sort of pull back a little bit or, on the contrary, an escalation? So this could go in many, many different ways. But certainly from the Ukrainian authorities' point of view, they believe that the Russian offensive has stalled in the Donbass. But that doesn't mean to say a Ukrainian victory. It doesn't mean that. It just means you know, some sort of, um, you know, balance of power. And, and it depends really now what Ukraine decides. Do they try to actually push back beyond? Uh, so this is an area, these stripes here, we, we can show you. Uh, this shows uh, areas that were controlled by pro-Russian forces before February the 24th. Does Ukraine actually try to push this back? Do they try and uh, 
push Russia back into the Crimean Peninsula. This is where they essentially spilled out from on the 24th of February to make these gains here in the south. How far does Ukraine go? These are all tactical, military and political decisions that we'll have to wait and see what Ukraine actually decides that it feels it can do. Tunisians joined millions of people around the world to mark the 2022 World Tai Chi and Qi Gong Day, an annual event held on the last Saturday of April to promote the related martial arts disciplines of Tai Chi Chuan and Qi Gong since 1999. CGTN's Adnan Chiao Chi reports from Tunis. Qi Gong, ambassador for Tunisia and Africa, the martial art expert from Cameroon invited many people to join his open air session in the natural park of Sidi Boussaïd, the northern suburbs of the capital city Tunis. Tai Chi and Qigong is spreading around the world. People in more than 90 countries are practicing this discipline to mark this special day because it has many health benefits. It's a source of well-being, reduces high blood pressure, it's good for mental, physical and emotional health. Tunisians and foreigners living in the country including children, say that practicing Tai Chi and Qigong, even once per week, has many benefits. So, as you see, we're welcoming a lot of people that come here for free and practice and discover the art of Tai Chi and Qigong. Uh, so we've been uh, doing this practice in Tunisia since now 12, 11, 12 years. We're a group of, uh, of uh, many persons from different nationalities, different backgrounds. I encourage everyone to try this discipline because it's a way to find out who you are and to connect with oneself and to our environment through slow movements and deep breathing. It's a way to have a moment of harmony inside and outside with the surrounding elements. Ulfa Ayeshi is a 44-year-old civil servant who defeated a deadly disease. She joined a group of novice and experienced fans of Tai Chi and Qigong as part of her recovery process. Olfa says this discipline has helped her achieve physical and psychological healing. Last year I got sick and the cure was long and tough. I stayed motionless at home for 12 months. I started practicing Tai Chi and King Gong to recover. Now I feel much better. This Chinese discipline has saved my life and allowed me to feel better. Tai Chi and Qigong has gained popularity in Tunisia since the outbreak of the global pandemic in March 2020. When Tunisian authorities issued stay-at-home orders and imposed restrictions during the lockdowns, many people started practicing Tai Chi and Qigong online. Martial artists are now joining clubs as the health situation improves in the North African country. Adan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. That brings us to the end of this bulletin. But before we take leave of you, here is a quick look at our top stories once again. The ambassador-designate of the Republic of Korea, His Excellency Kim Jin Jun, presented his letters of credence to the Gambian leader, His Excellency President Adam Abaro. Hundreds of mourners from far and near attended the burial of former Alcalo of Brikama Dembo Santangbojang. Plus, Victims of Casaman's conflicts have received humanitarian assistance from Child Fund de Gambia and the different United Nations institutions. In the internationals, Russian strikes have hit several regions across Ukraine, including the western hub of Lviv, six railway stations and a mountainous region bordering Hungary. And that's all we have for you for this hour. I'll be back at 2200 hours for more news and updates. Until then, thanks for the pleasure of your company. Christopher Moore, a team of superheroes with special powers unite to redefine the way we are connected. Step up your communication with.